Hi, everyone. It's Alan Shimo. You know, as long as I've been in tech, there's always been the push and pull between hardware and software. And who has the upper hand seems to go with the phases of the moon, so to speak. But we're going we're gonna to take a look at that today in light of some uh, new processor uh, innovations coming to market. We're going to look at Gen AI, and we're also going to look at the government becoming carrying a big stick, cracking down on some of these ransomware things. It's all here for you today on TechStrong Gang. All right, welcome to the TechStrong Gang. I'm Alan Schimmel, CEO, founder of TechStrong, and we're joined here today with our TechStrong gang regulars. To my far left, our chief content officer, Mike Vizard. Welcome, Mike. In between Mike and I, our Echo Insight sustainability and all around uh, science kind of person, Bonnie Schneider. Bonnie, welcome. And joining us from Colorado, our CTO and Principal Research Analyst at TechStrong Research, Mitchell Ashley. Hey, Mitch, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Okay, so Mike, what do we have on the docket today? Well, let's get started with this announcement from ARM where they're talking about their next generation of processor architectures that they plan to build with partners because they don't kind of build anything. They just work with partners who do all the manufacturing for them. But it's interesting to me that um, this is one of the latest announcements where it's heavily about the energy consumption. It's about how much these processors are kicking off in terms of watts. And I feel like every time I turn around now, somebody's talking about their energy and the infrastructure and how much that kicks off. And I know this is an area you track, yeah. but um, what's going on here? It seems like, you know, if, if people no, care. Yeah, people <laughs> care. <laughs> Well, I think people, they want uh, their architecture to be as proficient as possible, get as much done as possible, but the problem is the draining of the energy sources. So now ARM found a way to do that where they're minimizing energy sources and they're it really, by using less energy, they're improving the output of kind of reducing carbon emissions. And that's the overall goal for most of these companies. So if there's a way to do that while still keeping the output at what they want in terms of proficiency and productivity, they're absolutely going to go for it. And that's why we're seeing uh, more and more companies moving in this direction. All right. Mitch, do you think people are equating cost and energy just yet? Because it seems like sometimes I wonder if, you know, outside of Europe, we're just checking a box and going, yeah, okay, thank you very much. But I mean, how real? You're paying the light bills on an, in a data center. You definitely are. <laughs> <laughs> you feel it there. But the, these devices are also made to go at the edge, right? These are for a lot of network processing kind of things. And we've gone from all, you know, specialized individual chips just to do one kind of packet filtering, processing, whatever it might be, routing and network equipment to white boxing, you know, common off the shelf Intel hardware. Now, you know, aren't where ARM's taking it is a much more power efficient kind of processing chip that it, it's more than just a CPU. It's a system on a chip. So it has its own memory. It has its own storage. It's uh, kind of a computer on the chip is another another word for it, in, in addition to SOC, where it can do everything locally. So it's getting on the bus and hopping and talking to peripherals that are less efficient and take more energy. So the more they can compact into a chip, uh, the more efficient and power saving it can be. So it's definitely a trend. You see it with the Apple M1 and M2. That happens as well as the A series chips on phones. It, it, it's a trend I think we're going to continue to see. You know, I mean, there's nothing new about a computer on a chip. That I mean, even Intel was doing that some time ago. Interestingly, with ARM, as you mentioned, they don't own their own fab, right? Mm -hmm. They're strictly a designer, and then they use fabrication partners around the world, a lot in Taiwan, to, to build these chips. Um, and that's a very popular, and that was the dominant model for hardware in general, and then, you know, with the rise of Intel and, and of course, NVIDIA. And to me, look, this this whole ARM announcement screams, look at us, we're, we're, we're here too, not just NVIDIA, right? And, and I think what they're really trying to highlight, and I'll give ARM credit for it, they're pretty smart, is... People are realizing if we're going to use all these billions of dollars of NVIDIA chips that they're selling, we better, we better up our electricity capacity, you know, uh, ability to, to, because we don't have enough power to power all these chips. 
So it has to go, if we're going to use all these chips, they've got to be more efficient. I think there's two other things at play here. One is I can't get an NVIDIA GPU, so i got to figure out some way to run the inference engine at the edge because I, I'll be waiting a year for a GPU if I'm lucky. And the second part of that is we're seeing a shift where we're processing more data and analyzing it at the point where it's created and consumed at the edge. I need like serious compute power out there, but I can't you know, burn down a switch at the edge of a, of a neighborhood because I got overheated with my processors and technology. So energy efficiency matters to drive the next wave of edge computing. So it all comes full circle back to you. It does, and I think that um, that's that's the, the goal. But the main thing is, I, I, when I talk to people, is well, how much is this going to cost us? And I think that ARM is saying not only did we reduce our energy use, but we're actually reducing cost as well because we're using um, architecture that's more compact, it's smaller, and it's going to require more energy less energy is. Yeah. Mitch, I want to come back to something that you pointed out. The architecture is changing. So and he, you know, at the top of the show, we talked about the delicate dance between infrastructure and software. How will the way we write software change? Because it used to be, you know, I had processors X, Y, and Z over here, and I had compilers for that. And now if I have a SOC and there's different kinds of processors on the same SOC, how do, how do I write a compiler? How does the software get written? How will this whole thing evolve? Well, it, there's a match between kind of the code repository libraries uh, that you have to, like, do a PyTorch application, for example, for AI, to being able to talk to specific hardware. And some of that can be taken care of at that level. But it's kind of like if I know I'm on a general processing CPU that behaves one way versus I'm on a ro rocket ship GPU that may be embedded within a Neosphere, which, by the way, you had me at Neosphere. What a great name for a chip. Um, <laughs> um, you know, you now can do things that you weren't necessarily able to do, or you are having to buy specialized hardware in addition to kind of the, the service or the computer that you're running on. So I think it's a matter of that technical level. And then there's the innovation level of, well, what can I do now? Now that I've got this, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, beholden to one kind of chip, an AMD or uh, an NVIDIA to do uh, AI work. You know, Look, if, if there's a lesson we've learned in, in 50 plus years of, of computer chips and silicon is that what starts out on hardware eventually moves to software. And, and software, and for a lot of reasons, right? I mean, Mitchell and I were selling, you know, purpose-built appliances, right, for security 20-something, 20 25 years ago. And that almost in the blink of an eye disappeared because it was really, it was, you could do it at the software, you could do it at the Linux kernel ring, you could do it, there was no need to spend money on, on high use specialized silicon. And that's gonna happen here too. It's early, so NVIDIA is having their day and ARM is, you know, getting smart, but it, it's going to software. I would say it's not that black and white. Um, we see like originally hypervisor sat as software and more and more of that moved into the instruction set of the chip. So some things move up in the software, but other things drop down all the way into the chip and the silicon and that drives performance. Well, no, what happened is what Mitchell said, that what moved down is the chip became a, a, a computer on the chip, mm -hmm. right? But, but the fact is a lot of this stuff, the software, eventually more and more of it get, gets into the software, it's not the silicon. It's a delicate dance, as we <laughs> say. As I said, yeah, no, it, it goes. And because another way of looking at it is the more that we push up into the silicon, the more, I mean, into the software, the more innovation we could do at the hardware, because now we have room at that hardware level to, to do more, pack more transistors and do, you know, do more calculations, floating points and all that kind of good stuff. I think the one thing we can agree on is there's going to be a wave of app modernization here. We talk about this subject often, but um, we have a conference coming up where that's going to be one of the things that and we... And that's what we want to talk about yeah. when we'll be right back. <laughs> Sounds good. SecurityBoulevard.com is the leading resource for news, analysis, and education on challenges facing the cybersecurity industry. 
SecurityBoulevard.com covers all aspects of cybersecurity, including data security, DevSecOps, cloud security, application security, network security, security threats, and more. SecurityBoulevard.com has the largest selection of security content, featuring breaking news, blog posts, podcasts, and more. Visit www.securityboulevard.com to learn more. Securityboulevard.com, home of Security Bloggers Network. All right. Hey, hey, we're back here at Tech Strong Gang. So we left off on that modernization. Part of this whole, you know, it has such connotations, whether we're talking about mainframe. A lot of people mention that modernization around the mainframe. A lot of people talk about moving, you know, making applications cloud and cloud native versus data center. And of course that has a lot to do with what hardware we're running on as we were just discussing. And also quite frankly, Gen AI. If you're interested in this topic though, you know our annual TechStrong virtual event is coming up. I, I believe it's in June. Uh, yes, June. And uh, if you go to techstrongevents.com, you can read all about it. We're just, we still have a call for uh, speakers out there, people interested in sponsoring, check it out. But let, let's pivot a little bit from app modernization over to AI. Well, it all relates to app modernization at the end of the day because we're talking about now how Skillsoft is putting support for Gen AI into their developer training platform. And the idea here is that as you're training developers, Gen AI will pop up. They're working with OpenAI and offer suggestions and evaluate you know, what you've done for coding and maybe even throw you a test and certainly give you a summarization of the issues. Mitch, um, do you see that level of training required to master Gen AI, or is this just more of a hands-on thing? I know you're a hands-on guy, and you just kind of dive in and <laughs> figure it out on the way you, as you go. I mean, how much training are we going to have to give developers and DevOps teams to work with prompts and master all this stuff? Yeah, I think you. I think you can talk about it. Learn it as you go, right? There's a certain the, the things that do prompt completion or, or code completion where it fills in the rest of your code or a line of code, those are pretty straightforward to use in the co-pilots and the things that are in IDEs. I think the next step is you, you, need, you need some knowledge, especially if you're a, a more junior developer, you need some knowledge about how to figure out to write prompts to write code, just like we do whether we're using ChatGPT or Dolly or whatever it is. Um, and, and there, and that will get more sophisticated as well. But I think the, the idea of building that into our training is is a great move because let's equip people right up front, start them out that way. Here's how you do this, take advantage of this. And here's the other things you don't do without AI. Uh, but I think that's a necessity. They also talked about, I think in one of the articles you had on devops.com about creating either large language models or maybe small language models around development and specific kinds of apps and things like that. And that is and will be a, a definite move we'll see in software development. Yeah, I think as we go forward to your point, there's gonna be LLMs for specific tasks and, and each one is gonna have a little agent that you invoke and you're gonna to have to orchestrate all this stuff to kind of build an application and that becomes the thing. But I'd love to get your take on, is prompt engineering a, a job, job or is it just a skill that we're all supposed to have? It is, today it's a job. Tomorrow, it'll be a skill. To me, this is akin, you know, people of our, not yours, Brian, <laughs> but people of Mike and Mitchell and my generation, the internet was a learning process, right? And we still are learning, some of us. Um, but, you know, when I look at my children, they're digital natives. They grew up with the internet. It's common for them to just, that's how they communicate, that's how they get their worldview you know, set up and everything else. I think the generation coming up now will be AI natives. So the idea of how to prompt an AI or how to get the information you want out of an AI or expecting that a co-pilot like functionality will be built into their school projects and school applications that they use is, of course it's gonna be, I, you know. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I watch my, or I sometimes get to see my kids do schoolwork, very rarely. But even my wife, when she went back to get her master's degree, it's amazing. People in school now, they log into a portal, a portal on their, on their computer, 
their apps are in there and they're all preloaded and they're also, quite frankly, guardrailed so they can't do what they're not supposed to do to a certain extent. Gonna, of course they're gonna have AI built in there. I was wondering, uh, and Mitch, maybe you can answer this, if, uh, if developers, let's say, especially the younger ones that are coming up and they're already used to AI, they're leaning into it, how would they manage the balance of that human checking out, making sure the AI is correct and not leaning into it too much? Well, I think, I, so you mentioned kids, Alan, too, and to answer your question, Bonnie, I think about my granddaughter, you know, is in that kind of two age range. So she's grown up as a in this age of AI. I, I think with the people entering into software development now and then for the next few years, at some point it'll just become part of it. You'll, you, there'll be things you know it does well and you'll learn over time other things that it does well versus things that you're gonna just take and modify and check and be much more careful about that. But I think we're gonna reach a point where there's a whole suite of things that AI generated code do that you don't have to check right now. It's not gonna architect your system. It's not gonna design your whole app. So yeah. the article's talking about that design skill, that creative skill is really still what drives the whole process and AI, AI is an aid to that. But kind of to what Alan was saying, I think w there is a curve point that curve where you don't think about it anymore, right? You don't think about the gas pump or the oil, <laughs> whatever filter on your car, right? It just it just works, and we'll get there with parts of AI, maybe a lot of AI in development. Specifically to your question, look, I think today we're in a cycle where if AI wrote the code, we want to have a human check it. If a human wrote the code, we have AI check yeah. it. And yeah, AI does a good job of that. Speaking of that, do you think we'll get to a point where, I mean, we talked about hardware at the top of the show for an energy. Software is often the root cause of the problem because somebody wrote code that's consuming Highly too much energy. Yeah. Highly inefficient. You think we'll get to the point where Gen AI will pop up and say, this code is a pig and you yeah. can't run this and you know we'll have alerts that go beyond just... I think, I, that, I, I think that is the future. I think that if I someone's that not doing it, now. they're going to do Stop. it now. If you yeah. don't have that right now, you'll have it in the next three months. I think what it's going to, the real, here's the next step of that, though, which is, hey, this code's a pig. These are the changes. I just optimized it for you. And that well, is that what today. the developer yeah. of the future is going to have. He'll just write his code and the AI will optimize it. The other thing is, you can have AIs checking AIs. So I wrote it in this AI, and then I have a different LLM AI check it, right? So, you know, who's watching the watchers at this point? Yeah. I got to tell you, I, I had a conversation. <laughs> March 14th, coming up, is our 10-year anniversary at DevOps.com. I, I had a conversation with, um, not Andrew Schaefer, um, the other co-founder of Puppet. Is it Patrick Dubois? Or no, Patrick is DevOps. But no, he's the other co-founder of Puppet. And I forget his name now. Brilliant guy. Oh, yep. And he uh, said... The dagger guy? No, no, no. That's Docker. Oh, no, no, I'm, think, I'm sorry. I'm going on the wrong path. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll find his <laughs> name for us. But anyway, he told me that by 2035, most of our software will be written by software. And I said, really? He said, yeah, no, I'm telling you, that's what's going to happen. And I, I half believed him back then. Um, he's right on target. I, I think we're at this toddler stage right now. But by 2035, and I probably won't be working hopefully by then, <laughs> um, most software will be written by software. I would just close this conversation out by noting that most LLMs are kind of pigs when it comes to energy. So we need some work there to figure out how to make the LLMs the, the, more the efficient. The AI, yeah. so, and that, but isn't that the, isn't that one of the tests, like, like a Turing test of, of intelligence and sentience when you can improve yourself like that? I think AI will figure out how do I become more efficient? How do I make my LLM that I'm plugged into here more efficient? Look, it, it's a crazy world, but this is like a Petri dish in Darwinism at internet speed. And, and that's what we're, we're seeing, right? I mean, this whole, this whole thing's only a year and a half old. Well, the most of us, yeah. For most of us, right? You can go talk to John Willis. I'll give you the history of it. But, you know, it, look what progress has been made in a relatively short amount of time. It's turning out fake videos, you know, so... 
I'm, I'm bullish. Yeah, me too. Were you thinking of uh, Luke? Luke Kane? Yes, Kane? Luke Keeney's Kane. Yeah. Kane. Keys, so, yes, Luke. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you could go back somewhere in, I think it might be a DevOps chat, Mitch, an old DevOps chat. That was on DevOps.com. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of which, before we take for a break, have you checked out all the new TechStrong podcasts out there? We now have DevOps chats, Security Boulevard chats, TechStrong AI chats, Digital CXO chat, as well as DevOps Unbound, CISO Talk, and TechStrong Women. And, and, Ecotech Insights. and Ecotech Insights. They're Cloud available. Native Now chats. And, oh, I left out Cloud, Cloud Native, Native Now Cloud Native podcast Now. as well. I apologize. Thanks, Mitch. They're available on all of your favorite podcast channels. We have audio and video versions, as well as, I think coming next week, the newest TechStrong podcast, TechStrong Gang. You'll be oh. able to watch these on Apple, Muse, on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or listen to them or whatever you like. So stay tuned for that. We're going to be right back as we, we head into our third block today. All right, we're back for our third segment, and we're talking about how the government took down these LockBit ransomware folks. They seem like they're getting a whole lot more aggressive as of late. There are even bounties on cyber criminals. Why, it's just like the G-Men and John Dillinger. What do you oh, think? Bonnie and Clyde, yeah. <laughs> Not this Bonnie. <laughs> Not this Bonnie, right. Um, hallelujah, that's what I say. I mean, thank. we need to do something. And, and it's great that the U.S. is doing it. I, I'm assuming that they're working hand in hand with Interpol and, yeah, and some think, of the other. I think other. UK did UK most of the heavy lifting. Yeah, uh, and and because this is look, it's going to take a global effort. These people aren't contained in you know nation state borders. Um, we did. I think it was a Tech Strong gang a week or two ago of uh, one particular segment of ransomware was over a billion dollars last year or something like that. This, this is a menace that we need to rise up against and swat down. Um, and, and, you know, are we aggressive? I think we're not aggressive enough, frankly. Some of this, I'm sorry, I just want to say that some of the strategy that they're doing differently is not just going after the people that are doing it, but targeting the leader, because if they target the leader, they can have a better effect of breaking it down. And it, there has been a global effort in this one as well. I'm a little concerned about it. I was having a chat with some folks, and they're like, it seems like they're going after the big star criminals, just like Hoover did with the big criminals of the day. Meanwhile, banks were robbed left, right, and center by smaller criminals that no one ever heard of during the Depression, and now it seems like the same thing is happening. It's like basically all these big star names branded cyber criminal syndicates will just go underground, and they'll be like, I don't really want that level of fame. Two things to that. I'm sorry, go ahead, Mitch, you go yeah, first. It, it reminds me of kind of how we go after terrorism, right? There's big groups, well-named groups that we know governments go after, and now they're actually offering rewards. Like, I think the U.S. did, what, a $10 million reward for Black Cat? Black C-A-T, right? Uh, and, and you're right, they're going after the head instead of trying to, you know, get all the little parts at the bottom of the tree. So it seems like we're taking a similar strategy to that in... I know th there's an argument to be made, and Mike, I know that I'm making this argument of go for the big, go for the biggest fish you can get because you'll get the most things for that amount of effort, mo most problem solved, uh, most crime, you know, taken out of the ransomware equation. I'm not a law enforcement person, can't tell you if that's a viable strategy or not, but that seems to be what we're doing. So I, I think the better analogy than to G Men and Hoover and the Bonnie and Clyde era is the drug cartels, right? They went after the cartel and the cartel leadership. And the thing that 
makes this kind of thing more like that and less like the Bonnie and Clyde's is don't think that all of these ransomware activities are not related. The fact is ransomware Inc., Mm -hmm. Right? It's like Murder, Inc. or something like that. Ransomware, Inc. is a global conglomerate, but it very much has an ecosystem pecking order where it starts with the people who design the ransomware. They then sell the kits to the phishing guys who deliver it, who then sell the information they pilfer before they encrypt you to the next people who are then creating fake IDs and, and creating havoc. You know the old saying, stuff runs downhill. So it's a ransomware at a service. They, 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 well, ran it yeah. is ransomware as a service. Literally, it's, yes, you're right. It's, it's Black Hat as a service, and not Black Cat. Black Hat as a service. This is a highly organized criminal enterprise, and you got to cut the head off the snake. Well, let me tell you how silly it's gotten. So I was at this Qualys event last November, and Rachel Wilson was there, and she runs cybersecurity for Morgan Stanley. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about how now they basically just send them a note saying, you know, we could do this, and if, we, if you pay us, we won't do this. And then, by the way, we'll tell you what we would do if um, we were to do it. And by the way, for an extra fee, we'll come in and clean up those vulnerabilities for you. So it's become this <laughs> kind of ridiculous... It's, real, it's like living in Sicily, you know, under the mafia <laughs> yeah, yeah. or yeah. something. Yeah. Payola, right? Yeah, yeah no, it's protection. It's protection. It's protection. my payment. You know what? You don't want those windows broken. So before I throw the brick through the window, pay me. Really nice SaaS application you have there. Be ashamed if something yeah. happened to it. <laughs> how, how does the how do different organizations prepare for something like that if it's coming, um, you know, with Fast and Furious and and so many different directions? Um, maybe what, what would you guys advise in terms of of that? I think you got to minimize the blast radius is the first thing. And so it's going to happen. So the question is, is it going to be all your data or is it going to be just enough data that you can live without it and the business can go on? So you see a lot of people talking about data security posture management these days. And there's a lot of focus on that. People are realizing that um, I may not give up my firewall, but that's kind of like just the frontline defense. And I need to kind of defend all these different pieces and I need to figure out what data is valuable and you would think that would be a simple thing to do but it turns out IT people don't really know what the data is because they've been storing and processing it but they don't really know the value of that data only the business people know the value of that data and the two of them don't always talk so well together that's a good point so this is a very common in the security world that Mitchell and I have been in 20 years you got to look at it you can make all the plans you want to try to stop them God bless you. You're not going to. You've got to put an equal amount of time into what happens when I get hit. Mm -hmm. What's my recovery plan? What's my plan B? How to keep the lights on? AT&T is out today. Mm -hmm. I'm freaking out in the car on the way here because I thought it was just my phone. Um, we, you need your recovery plans. It's disaster recovery, DR. It's never been more important. I. You know, this is this is a real, I mean, it's classic, it's classic security stuff. I'll tell you who else. They're not necessarily a villain, but they have an outsized uh, influence in this whole thing is the cyber insurance companies. And maybe we could do that on a future show. But they're the ones who are dealing with the ransomware, negotiating with the ransomware people. They're the ones who are deciding to pay or not to pay because they've dealt with these people so much. And they're also becoming now the new regulator saying, if you want insurance, this is what I need you to have. How far should the government go? Because recently there was an example where they went, they got a court order. And because uh, somebody in Russia took over a bunch of routers in people's homes, the government went in and fixed all those routers on behalf of national interest and most of the people who own those routers didn't even know it was probably happening they just kind of got a court order and worked it out with the service providers and away they went why don't they just go the full nine yards and say hey let's just start fixing stuff that when we discover vulnerabilities versus just sending me a note saying you know you ought to do something about this that's what they do in beijing <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to live in beijing right i'll leave it at that <laughs> all right 
fine line between helping yeah, and totalitarianism. Actually, yeah. I, I just read an article this morning, actually, that in China they, they've privatized their hackers. So the government actually pays them. I, I need to break into some Twitter X accounts. $100,000, i give you the app wow. to do that. I want to get into the US DOD. Here, boom, here's our, thing. you know, it, it, it really, it's Crime Inc., right? And, or Nation State Hacking Inc. Mitch, to be fair, I think uh, democracies give as good as they get as part of the problem here in the nation states because they build all these fancy tools that wind up being sold on the internet for 10 bucks a throw. Well, where there's a problem, there's opportunity, right? <laughs> in any Life will find society. a way. You know, we, we had um, a gentleman, Stephen Baker, who was on CISO Talk. I think it was mid-year last year. I'll, I'll keep the, the link to the interview. Fascinating because he works for a firm and he's he's the the go-to person. Who do you call when you've been, you know, Ghostbusters? Who do you call when you've been compromised? And that's the kind of person you bring in about, do you pay the ransom? What do we, we have an incident response time, but, you know, should we shut down the server? No, it's, it's, it's encrypting things right now. Don't do that. But to work with people, not only on the technical side of it, but to your point about um, insurance, cyber crime insurance firms, this is a, more of a specialist doing that, but helping you with, do we pay? Do we negotiate? Do we move on? Do we ignore? What is our best strategy here? Because we aren't we, we we don't deal with this every day. We're not equipped with no, what to do. But but the know? interesting thing, Mitchell, and, and when the insurance companies involved, they take away your right to make that decision. Yeah, that, they that's say, the tough part. We're the insurance carrier. We'll decide whether we're going to pay or not. We'll decide what you, the response is going to be. You cannot negotiate with the ransomware people. You can't do anything. You've subrogated your rights to that, to the insurance carrier when you got the insurance. It's the same thing if you ever did a bodily injury case on a car accident or something. You don't get to settle that. The insurance company does. And, and so the insurance companies have a very oversized influence on this whole ransomware issue. And doesn't it also depend on where it happens? If they're in an area or a government that's not cooperating, let's say with the U.S. government, that's only going to complicate things. Yeah, I, so the insurance companies know, all right, the Mike gang, they're, they're honorable thieves. If, <laughs> if I give them the money, they'll unencrypt me. Yeah. Mitchell, boy, they take the money and run, and half the time they give you the unencryption key, and half the time they don't. We're the Sia gang. Sia. Yeah. See ya. <laughs> but, you know, none of these, you don't find many of these gangs based in Arlington, Virginia or anything. You know, they're all in com countries where it's hard to reach. Right. Those are the Beltway bandits in right. Arlington. Those are the <laughs> Beltway bandits. Exactly. Exactly. Mitchell, the Beltway yeah. bandits. But, you know, the long arm of the NSA can reach pretty far. Well, that's the question. It seems like, are we getting more aggressive on the good guy side? And because we can see their infrastructure, we know where they are, we have a pretty good idea who they are. We may not be able to arrest them, but we can certainly do things to their systems. So I will, you've got, that's the point. And here's the, and I remember this, there was a, uh, it was a healthcare hospital encryption, a ransomware attack in, during COVID. I mean, what kind of slime would try to shut down a hospital in the middle of COVID? And they were successful and they got whatever it was, 50 or 100 Bitcoins or something. And miraculously, the next week, those Bitcoins were taken out of that account that they were put into. And they're supposed to be anonymous and non-reachable and everything else. They never stood up and took credit for it, but you know who did that. Right? It was the people of Fort Meade. And those are the ones that you don't hear about mm -hmm. that we do do a lot. Yes, taking down Lockbit, everybody, you know, it's a photo op. Mm -hmm. Kind of like when we seize all the cocaine on a boat coming from into Miami here or something. But don't think for a second that there's not a lot of unreported activity. Happening behind the scenes, kind of. Yes. All right, we're going to leave you with that mental in image of a perp walk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did not, I'm not really interested in any of this, but um, no, it's good. Yeah, um, I, I mentioned earlier the cell phone outage today. I, I wanted to just end with that. You know, we talk about ransomware, and we talk about all this great new hardware, and we talk about everything. 
we're on a, in society and civilization, we're on such a thin line where if our internet doesn't work or our cell phone doesn't work, man, it's like shut down. There's no sense living. <laughs> and and is, are, we, are we so or too dependent on, on these technologies? And, and, you know, it's just, it's, you know, we talk about digital natives and AI natives. What's going to happen if the AI doesn't yeah. work? We talked Frank about this earlier, and I laughed because your reaction was, it was my phone, and it's personal against me, and not thinking <laughs> yeah. that the rest of the world perhaps was having exactly. the same problem. Yeah. Yeah. And then I told <laughs> well, you it was, wasn't until uh, Bonnie I, I told me. I was like, like, <laughs> it wasn't me. I just, great. Yeah. I was ready to throw my phone away. I was oh, heading no. to the Apple store. But anyway, something to think about. We talk about, you know, not if, but when. Have a plan in case the internet doesn't work or your cell phone doesn't work. It doesn't mean your life ends. I hope not. I guess the lesson is if the internet goes out, be near Alan in case he throws his phone out. <laughs> yeah, I guess. This, 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 this could be just a massive <laughs> government training exercise to get us ready for the possibility <laughs> that if there is if some works. sort of war that we'll figure out what to do without our phones. We're the frog in the pot. <laughs> yep. Anyway, I think that's going to wrap up Tech Strong Gang for today. Hey, don't go away, though, because we've got a full couple more hours of Tech Strong TV interviews, sessions, learning, good times. Stay tuned. But for now, this is Alan Schimmel from Mike Rizard, Bonnie Schneider, Mitchell Ashley. We're the Tech Strong Gang. We're out.